Now, earlier in the service, we sang the first half of Matthew chapter number six. We'll actually sing the second half um, towards the end of the well, at the end of the service. And Matthew chapter six is part of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. You've got chapter Matthew chapter five, six, and seven, and they are basically three consecutive chapters of Jesus speaking. If you had like a red letter Bible, you'd notice that those chapters were just basically read, read after read after read. And um, where we are, where we've just read in John chapter number 16, this actually comes in the middle of a similar section in the Gospel of John, where there are basically four consecutive chapters. John chapter number 14, 15, 16, and 17 are pretty much almost entirely made up of Jesus speaking. Where they're in John chapter 16, look, look if you were at verse number 20, verse number 20 of John chapter number 16. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. But the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now you might notice, as we read through those verses, there was two sort of contrasting ideas that kept coming up. We came across words like weep, lament, sorrowful, sorrow, travail, sorrow, anguish, sorrow. But at the same time, as we read through, we also came across words like rejoice, joy. Joy, rejoice, joy, joy. Now, our youngest daughter, Rebecca, has actually got the middle name of joy. Rebecca Joy is her name. And I remember when she was born, it was a time of great joy for our family. I mean, she still does bring us joy. She brings us lots of laughs. But um, it's the same with with all of our children. I think back with the birth of of all of our children, we think of the joy that was there. Um, I mean, well, I suppose there was kind of an exception. We we had our our oldest daughter, Laura. She was born um, 13 and a half years ago. She was she was born and died. She was born prematurely and born and died the same day. That was pretty much just just mostly sorrow as opposed to joy that was there. But but you know that that was definitely a sorrowful time. But here we see in this very passage, Jesus is contrasting with 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 most births. He says, look, you've got sorrow and you've got anguish when a woman is in what? She's in travail. She's in labour. She's she's got pains because she's going to deliver a child. And then it contrasts that with the joy that she has when the child is born. In other words, the joy is so great, it's like she forgets how much sorrow and pain and anguish that she had. Okay. Now here's the thing. Do you think that God wants us to have joy in our lives? Do you think he wants us to have joy in our lives? Absolutely he does. Turn if you would, keep your finger in John, but look at, um, look at Psalm number 16. Psalm number 16. Psalm number 16. And look at verse number 8. Psalm number 16. <clears throat> Psalm 16 and verse number 8. It says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So notice, God, he, in, in, in the presence of God, there is, there's pleasures, there's joy forevermore. God does desire us to have joy in our lives. Because if he didn't, then why would, okay, you come to heaven, you come and be in my presence, and it's joyful. That's obviously what God desires. In his presence of full, is fullness of joy. God wants his people to be joyful people. Back in John chapter 16, actually just the chapter before, in John chapter 15, verse number 11, Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. That my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Jesus wants us to be full of joy. Turn, if you would, to uh, Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4. We're, we're going to be there on Thursday night. Philippians chapter number 4. And while you do, I'll read to you from 1 Thessalonians 5.16. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, not very long verse, rejoice. Evermore. Rejoice evermore. Notice, notice though that that's a command. Yeah, that's right. The Bible says rejoice evermore. Look at um, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. It says rejoice in the Lord always. And just in case we missed it. And again I say 
rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. The word rejoice just means to feel or express joy. It's talking about being happy. It's talking about being glad. Don't need to turn there, but it says in Psalm 118 verse 24, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We often sing that one, actually. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If we take joy in something, then we delight in it. Yeah. We delight in it. We, we take pleasure in it. We enjoy it. I mean, think that, that word joy is in the, in, it's inside the word joy. Yeah. Um, now, sometimes people can be a bit confused about always rejoicing, being filled with joy. They think, well, well look, I can't be happy because, you know, I, I can't be joyful because, look, I've got these troubles. I've got these troubles. I've got these sort of bad times that I'm going through. My life is really a life of sorrow rather than a life of joy. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that we shouldn't ever experience sorrow. That's what I'm saying at all. I mean, Jesus himself, he's described as a man of sorrows. Isaiah 53 tells us, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. So the Christian life is not a life which is without sorrow. But here's the thing. The Christian life, it's a different sorrow than the, than the world has. It's a different sorrow. Look, if you would, at um, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye, notice this, sorrow not, even as others which have no, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then notice what it says at the end. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Because notice, we do experience sorrow. We experience sorrow, but it's not the same as the world's sorrow. He says, look, I don't want you to sorrow, um, even as others, which have no hope. I would not have to be ignorant, brethren, he says. We're not going to sorrow in the same way that they are. And the reason is because we know that we're going to see our loved ones again. You know, we're going to see our loved ones again. He says, look, it's not a case of, you know, I mean, when, when, when someone who's unsaved, when they die, when their family members die, when their friends die, it's like, I'll never see them ever again. But that's not the same. That's not the same for us. When a fellow believer dies, it's just like, well, it's, it's farewell for a time. But we know that when Jesus comes back, it says, look, we which are alive and remain, if we're still alive when Jesus comes back, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. But before that happened, what is it? We shall not prevent those which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from people with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So those believers who have already died, they will rise first. Then we'll be caught up together to meet them, to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we be with the Lord. And therefore it says, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so here's the thing. Even though we might go through difficult times, because it's not, it's not easy if a loved one dies. It's not, that's, not a, that's not an easy thing. But we can still rejoice. We can still rejoice. Turn if you want to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And verse number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And verse number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So notice, there's this inheritance we've got. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it doesn't fade away, and it's reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to reveal, be revealed in the last time, wherein, look what it says here, ye greatly rejoice. Ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, that means for a time, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold, manifold temptations. So look, you're rejoicing even though you're in heaviness, even though you're going through difficult times, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto Praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is talking about the same thing. When Jesus appears. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom though now ye see him not. Yet believing, ye rejoice 
with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Notice it says, whom having not seen, you love. Yeah. And it says, whom now, though now, you see him not, yet believe in, you rejoice. Even heard people say, well, I've seen Jesus. There's people, around, I've seen Jesus. He appeared to me. He came and I saw him. Well, why does Peter say, whom having not seen, you love? Okay? The people who, I mean, you ask these people who say they've seen Jesus, ask this, what did he look like? Mm-hmm. What did he look like? And nine times out of ten, they'll give you a description. They'll describe a Catholic Jesus, you know, or a Mormon Jesus, this sort of long-haired, hippie-type Jesus. That's what they describe. Yeah. You know, wearing, wearing a dress. That's what they'll say. This is what Jesus is like, because that's what they've seen in the pictures. But that's not the, that's not the Jesus that we see described in the Bible. You're there in 1 Peter chapter number 1. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4 and verse number 12. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 12. We sang this before. 1 Peter 4 and verse number 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So does that sound good, a fiery trial? Sounds pretty difficult. Uncomfortable. He says, look, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You see, suffering is not something that's particularly joyful in most people's eyes. But Peter says we should be happy. We should be glad with exceeding joy. Turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 11. And Jesus said the same thing. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 11. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 11. He says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Look what he says here. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Not just glad. Exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Jesus, he says the same thing that Peter does. Look, the common thing that Paul said, that Peter said, that Jesus all talked about, was that we should be joyful because of something that's going to happen in the future. Something that's going to happen in the future. Paul said we shouldn't sorrow as those, you know, about those who have died in Jesus, because what? We're going to meet them again. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. Peter said even though we're reproached and in heaviness for a season, we should rejoice because we will be glorified when Christ appears. Jesus said when we are reviled and persecuted, we should rejoice because great will be our reward in heaven. Look at James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1 and verse number 2. James chapter number 1 and verse number 2. James chapter 1 verse 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith work of patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What does James say? He says, count it all joy. When you're going through difficult times, count it all joy. Let's look back just a page to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 12, Hebrews chapter number 12, and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, obviously this is coming straight after Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, talking about the, all, the, all the people who have come in the past and all the faith they had, and some of the difficult things that they went through. Yeah. Remember they endured, you know, you know, trials of mockings and scourgings, you know, they were sawn asunder, all these different things that happened to them. Look what Jesus says about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, look, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. This is these people that in chapter 11 talks about. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the races set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You see, Jesus, did he enjoy going to the cross? Do you think, yeah, this is great. Really look forward to it? No. But he did it for the future joy that was set before him. He was thinking of the long-term benefit, you know, rather than what might be attractive in the short term. I'm sure in the, attract- in the short term he's thinking, I'd rather not. In fact, didn't he pray? You know, Father, if it be possible, you know, let this cup pass from me. That, that's exactly what he did. But here's, here's the thing. Look at, um, the thing about it is, is the short-term thing is often the wrong thing to be focused on. You know, Jesus didn't look at the short-term, what's the pain I'm going to go through? He looked at bringing many people, bringing salvation to all that would call upon him, all that would believe. Look, if you were back at Hebrews chapter number 11, and we can see the same sort of thing. Well, it's kind of the opposite thing. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 24. 
It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see, here's the thing. The thing about sin is that in the short term, sin can be a pleasurable thing. It's something that can be enjoyed, but for a season, for a short time. You see, the pleasure that sin gives us, it's short-lived. It doesn't last. It doesn't last. Compare that with what we read about in Psalm 16. It says, look, in thy presence is fullness of joy. Yeah. Not just partial joy, fullness of joy. At thy, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Right. Not pleasure for a season, just not the temporary pleasure that sin will bring. You might say, okay, I, I see we're supposed, to, we're supposed to have a life filled with joy. I need to be focused on the promises God has given, you know, rather than my current problems. Yeah. But I still don't feel very joyful. I still don't feel very joyful. Well, the fact is, there are actually things which can take away joy from a Christian. There are things, if, the, if you're not feeling joyful, there can, there can be reasons for that. Turn, if you would, to 1 John, chapter number 1. 1 John, chapter number 1. 1 John, chapter number 1. And look at verse number 4. 1 John, chapter number 1. And verse number 4. 1 John, chapter 1, verse number 4. It says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy... May be full. Why was John? Why did John write the epistle of, of, of um, you know, the, the first general epistle of John? He wrote it that our joy might be full. These things write we unto you that your joy might be full. But then look at chapter number two, chapter two, verse one. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. So in chapter one, he's saying, I'm writing this because so that you can have, you know, your joy might be full. In chapter two, he's writing, they sin not. Which one is it? Well, the answer is it's both. It's both. Because joy is associated with not sinning. He wrote this book so they wouldn't sin, and he wrote this book so their joy would be full. Because those two things go hand in hand. Now, it's true that we all sin. It's true that we all sin. But the more righteous a life we live, the greater will be our joy. The greater will be our joy. Turn forward to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. While you do, I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter number 1. It says in Hebrews chapter number 1, in verse number 8, it says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A sceptre of righteousness is the sceptre of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. You're there in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, this was written by David after he sinned with, with Bathsheba. Look at Psalm number 51. It started in... Um, well, let's just start in verse number one. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy love and kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth, in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So notice what he's saying here. He's saying, look, this is after he'd committed this grievous sin with Bathsheba. And he's saying, cleanse me from this. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness. He says, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me, notice he says, the joy of thy salvation. He says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You see, David didn't say, restore to me my salvation. He said, restore the joy of thy salvation. You see, because David couldn't lose his salvation, but he did lose his joy. He did lose his joy. Why? Because he lost the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And obviously this was, you know, in the Old Testament it was different. This is not talking about the, the indwelling, the Holy Ghost, which didn't come until, you know, Jesus said, you know, it's not until I go away, then the comfort is going to come, all that sort of stuff. And so we know the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. But the Holy Spirit's always been around, and the Holy Spirit would come upon people with power. The Holy Spirit would be upon David with all the mighty acts that he did. I mean, the Holy Spirit was upon King Saul beforehand. But what happened? 
God removed his Holy Spirit from Saul, didn't he? He was, he was even troubled by an evil spirit. Now, he wasn't possessed by an evil spirit because Saul was someone who was saved. Yes. You know, he was the, the first king of Israel, someone that God chose. Yes. But what happened to him? He fell into a life of sin, a life of just complete... You know, he wasted his life. He ended up killing himself. But here's the thing, we see that David was saying, look, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And the thing about it is, one of the reasons he's saying, look, restore the Holy Spirit, now don't take away the, the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and joy actually go together. The Holy Spirit and, and, and joy actually go together. It says in Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 52, it says that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. It says in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, notice that, and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter number 15, verse number 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on. When we sin... We quench the spirit in our lives. And we lose our joy. Why? Because it breaks our fellowship with God. It breaks our fellowship with God. Hopefully, if, did you keep your finger in, I should have asked you to keep your finger in First John chapter number 1. First John chapter number 1. Look back there again. He says, And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. And then he says in verse 5, This then is the message which we've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if we're saying we're fellowshiping with God, but at the same time we're walking in darkness, what's that? That's living a life of sin. He's saying we lie and do not the truth. Turn if you're to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 1. Have a look at some things that will take away your joy, things that will take away the Holy Spirit's power in your life. Look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 1. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are, which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Look at this. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And you see this emphasis throughout Paul's epistles. He, he tells people, this is the way you behave when you're a Gentile. This is the way the Gentiles still walk. But he's saying, don't you do that. Now some people say, oh look, when someone gets saved, this well, the Holy Spirit's going to come in and their life will clean up and they'll just be onward and upward and better and better. Then why is the Bible full of all these exhortations yeah. to believers to say, don't commit fornication. Yeah, yeah. Don't do these wicked sins. Get the sin out of your life. He says, look, he says, don't be partakers with them. He says, ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. So these are people who are saved. Ye are light in the Lord. And what does he say? Walk as children of light. He's saying, look, you are saved. You're a child of, of, of light. But then walk that way. Let's see some of it going on in your life. Okay? He says, don't be partakers in those things. Now, if you are partaking in those things, what should you do? Confess and forsake them. Because if you don't, you're not going to have joy in your life. You know? And here's the thing. Even if you're not actually doing those things, maybe you're not, you know, maybe you're not committing all these wicked sins we've just gone through and listed here. But what about this? Should you take pleasure in people who do them? No. Not according to Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Don't have pleasure in people that do them. You know, maybe, maybe you don't tell dirty jokes, but do you take pleasure in listening to them? You know, you're not the one at work who's telling dirty jokes, but you sort of, you know, you're just snickering under your breath and think, oh, that's funny. Maybe you don't commit fornication, you know? Maybe you're not lusting after things you don't have. Maybe you're not drinking alcohol. Maybe you're not using blasphemous speech. But do you take pleasure in watching people do those things? You know, maybe you flick on the telly and that's what you see. You know, and we, oh, we were in First John. In First John chapter number 2, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Look, the Bible talks about 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Where do we see that? We see that today. Turn on TV. That's where you see it. You see it on the TV. You know, on the internet. You know, Jesus made it clear that sins that go on in your mind are real sins. It's a real sin. You know, Jesus said, you know, you heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. He's saying, don't, don't do those things. You know? Look, if you want at um, Yeah, so we, we uh, look back again at, at First John again. First John, First John chapter one, verse number four. First John chapter one, verse number four. The first point was First John chapter one, verse four. These things write unto that your joy may be full, my little children. These things write unto that ye sin not. If you want to have joy in your life, you need to cut the sin out of your life. Cut the sin out of your life. It means increase your righteousness. If you increase your righteousness, you will increase your joy. A great way to make changes in your life is, look, how about this? Replace some of the things you shouldn't be doing with things you should be doing. You know, you've got trouble with your eyes, what you're looking at? How about this? Replace it with reading the Bible. You know? You've got trouble with your going and doing things you shouldn't be doing? How about this? Go and do things you should be doing. Go and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to the lost. You know? You find you, you. You know, the Bible says, Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunk and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. Don't hang around with people that are gluttonous. Don't hang around with, with drunkards. Well, I wonder how I could avoid that. How about come to church and hang around God's people? That'd be a great idea. Be around God's people. I mean, that's just a great principle. Be around people that you want to be like. You know, if you want to be a drunk, if you want to be a glutton, go and hang out with people like that. And that's the sort of life that you'll end up living. You know? I mean, it amazes me when... People, they, they send their children away to, to go to university in a, in a different city. Or maybe even they're in the same city. Yeah. I mean, well, in fact, there are them, the people in our street. And they've got, they've got children, and they're going to university. And instead of, like, staying, you know, being at home with their parents and, you know, going and studying and, you know, the thing that you're supposed to be at university for, what do they do? Yeah. What lots of kids do now, they go to the hostels. Yeah. Now, it wasn't a thing in my day. I mean, in my day, no one, you know, it's just so expensive. Yeah. But money doesn't seem to be an object now. They why why they go to hostels? Because it's the party life. Yeah. That's where everyone is. It's, everyone's having a party. They're drunk and all that. That's what's going on all the time. And so that's what they're going there for. I mean, the vast the Tar University advert. It's like, come on down. This is what it's for. It's just a big old party. Yeah. Well, look, if you're going to hang around people that are doing that, you know, they're at the top of the class, aren't they? I mean, I, know, I, I teach at the vast, and I notice that the top of the class. It's the brightest students, the ones who are working hard, doing really well, they're the ones that are out partying all weekend, aren't they? Oh no, they're the ones that don't show up to class. They're the ones that fail. You know, they're the ones that waste their money, and, and I've got some of those too, and they just come in year after year. It's like two, three, four, five years, and they're still sitting the same paper. What are they there for? Crazy. <coughs> Here's the thing. God tells us that we should be in his word. We should be reading his word. God tells us we should be preaching the gospel to the lost. God tells us, to forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. God tells us to do these things. So not doing those things is actually sin. You know, when you read your Bible, when you preach the gospel, when you come to church, that's going to help you not to sin. But actually not doing those things is in of itself a sin. But when you do those things, it'll help keep you from other sins. You see, when you go out and you make the effort and go out to preach the gospel to someone, you're standing there showing someone how to be saved. Do you know one thing that you'll, you'll, that'll come to your mind? You'll think to yourself, you know, you think of sins in your life. Yeah. And you think, I'd hate to think that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be upon me in power and that this person wouldn't get saved because of the lack of Holy Spirit power in my life yeah. when you're out there preaching the gospel to someone. You know? Because I'm, because I'm listening to things I shouldn't be listening to, because I'm watching things I shouldn't be watching, because I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing, and then all of a sudden it's like you go out and, and people don't get saved. Now here's the thing, people still have a choice. Understand that. But the fact is, God's Spirit will be on you yep. in power when the sin's out of your life. Exa- I mean, isn't that, I think that is exactly what David said. I think he did. Didn't he say that? It was just my imagination. In Psalm 51, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He said, And uphold me with thy free spirit. Yeah, verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Yep. You know? Notice. There's a correlation. There's a correlation there. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to um, Psalm 95. Turn to Psalm 95. 
Hmm. I should just keep my place. I was just in Psalm 51. Look at Psalm number 95. The second point I want to look at, I want to look at a way that we can lose our joy. I want to look at a specific way we can lose our joy. Look at Psalm 95. Psalm 95 in verse number 1. It says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. The thing is, this, this psalm is exhorting us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, to sing psalms, to come before his presence with thanksgiving. It's worth noting that among other things, joy is an emotion. Joy is an emotion. And the thing about emotions is that you can change your emotions by taking action. When you take action, that will change your emotions. Because you might notice motion is actually in the word emotion. Movement, okay? When you take action, when you actually do something. I mean, has anyone ever thought, you know, I really should go for a run or maybe do some sort of exercise, but you just really don't feel like it? You've been, you've been like that? You thought, oh, I need to go for a run, I need to do but you just don't feel like it. What happens when you force yourself to take action? You know, you put on your running shoes, you go out there. After five or ten minutes, what happens? Normally, you actually get into it. You actually feel like doing it. You know, sometimes it might take longer, but here's the thing. Emotion follows action. Well, here's the thing. If you sit down, if you really feel down and depressed, singing psalms, singing hymns, can actually lift your spirits. It can actually lift your spirits. But notice also in verse number two that joy is associated with thanksgiving. Come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. You see, it's impossible to be joyful and at the same time to be unthankful or ungrateful. Think about that. If you're unthankful, if you're ungrateful, can you at the same time be joyful? No, th th those, those two things, they, they don't go together. When someone is joyful, they express it by making a joyful noise, praising, thanking, singing. But when someone is ungrateful, what sort of noise do they normally make? If they're ungrateful, they grumble, yeah. they complain. Look, if you were at um, Numbers, chapter number 13. Look at Numbers 13. <coughs> numbers, chapter number 13. <coughs> we're talking about having joy in your life tonight. But there are things that will take away your joy. There are things that will prevent you from having joy. Look at Numbers, chapter number 13. Numbers 13, verse number... <coughs> oh, we'll start at maybe verse number 25. So remember, they, these were the, the spies that got sent out to spy out the land. And it said in verse number 25, And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So they're saying, Look, This is what we found here, this amazing land. Nevertheless, the people be strong to dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. I mean, do you really think that they were... You know, was it they re re really? I mean, sure, they were, they were giants. You know, Goliath might have been nine foot, ten foot tall. But I mean, there's a bit, think about a grasshopper. I mean, a grasshopper, you stand on a grasshopper. You know, they're exaggerating. They make it sound worse than it is. Yeah. Look at verse 9, chapter 14. It says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Yeah. So they're weeping and wailing. <laughs> and all the children of Israel murmured. Notice that. They murmured against Moses 
and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. So notice, the people brought up a bad report, and then everyone's weeping and wailing and they're murmuring and complaining and saying, look, it would be better if we'd died. I mean, come on, you haven't died yet. And God's actually said, go in and you're going to be able to possess the land. Don't need to turn there, but it says in Numbers chapter number 11, verse 1, it says, and when the people complained, because it's not the first time, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. When the people complained, it displeased. Actually, yeah, maybe you should turn there. Turn to Numbers 11, and verse 1, and un- underline that in your Bible. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord. What does God think about complaining? What does God think about complaining? Look at verse number 11 of chapter 14. Look at verse number 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. So notice, this complaining and grumbling, it's associated with unbelief. Look down at verse number 26. Verse number 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, And unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Notice how many times he talks about murmuring. Doubtless, Ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, and Joseph, Joshua excuse me, the son of Nun. But your little ones which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. What does God think about their complaining? He doesn't like it, because it shows ungratefulness, and it discourages people around you, but it can even, you know, the thing about it is, is look, you can complain to God. It's true, you can complain to God. It says in Psalm 55 verse 2, Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Psalm 144 verse 2 says, I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. There's nothing wrong with telling God about your troubles. But when you're murmuring, complaining, and telling everyone else about all the bad things, God doesn't like that. You know? We should really, when we come to God, even when we're... You know, we've got troubles. We should still do it with an attitude of thankfulness. You know, look if you were to um, look at uh, Philippians chapter number four. Philippians chapter number four. I'm sure we're going to be there again in, on Thursday. But Philippians chapter number four, and look at verse number four. Philippians chapter four and verse number four. Rejoice, Lord, always. And again, I say, rejoice. It says that your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It says, be careful for nothing. That means be. Don't be filled with care. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, notice this, with thanksgiving. Isn't that what it said back in Psalm 95? Yeah. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse number 8. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be virtue, if there be praise, think on these things. Those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So notice, we're supposed to bring our request to God with thanksgiving, but then also we're supposed to think right thoughts. Think right thoughts, not to be worried. I mean, what these people are all about, this is what's going to happen. You know, they're just exaggerating and murmuring and mumbling and complaining. It's bad for your mind to be a complainer. I mean, have you ever known someone that complains a lot? I've known a few people that complain a lot. And here's the thing. And, and sure, you know, little children, they can tend to complain. Little children can tend to complain. Mm. But when we grow up, we should grow out of that and stop that. Yeah. But have you known like an adult that complains a lot? Yeah. I have. Yeah. And you know, the people that I've known that complained a lot, they tended to be sick. <laughs> Mentally sick. Yeah. Physically sick. Because <coughs> they, they were doing the opposite of Philippians 4 verse 8. Instead of looking for what things are true and honest and things are virtue, they were looking for whatever's bad and, and miserable. And, and guess what? Yep. Seek. The Bible says seek and you'll find. Yep. Seek and you'll find. So here's the thing. How do we avoid the temptation to murmur and complain? Because we can all be tempted to murmur and complain and grumble. 
Well, decide to be thankful. Decide to be grateful. Look for good things and thank God for them. The spies, they chose to focus on the bad aspects of the promised land instead of the good aspects. Look where it got them. I remember hearing a, a, an acronym years ago which shows how to be happy. And it's about the word joy. Yeah. You know the word joy? J-O-Y. And it stands for Jesus, others, and yourself. Yeah. If you keep things in that order, your life will be a lot more joyful. Think Jesus first, then think about other people, yes. then think about yourself. Because yeah. if you listen to people who are really unhappy, you'll usually find they spend most of the time thinking about and talking about who? Themselves. It's all about themselves and how bad I've got it. And there, I mean, there are people like that. I'm, I won't name names. But I can think of particular, there's a particular person who's coming to mind. And no matter what, and you try and help him look on the bright side, there's just no bright side. He'll just find the bad. He'll just find the bad. You know? Turn back to uh, Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. <coughs> look at verse number 14. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 14, it says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Don't murmur. Didn't make God happy. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Don't argue. And then it says, That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You see, because if, if you are murmuring, if you are disputing, if you are grumbling, if you are complaining, guess what? You're not blameless. You're not harmless. And guess what? You deserve to be rebuked. And God will rebuke you. And you're not shining as a light like you should. Psalm 144, verse number 9 says, I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. It says that our oxen, verse 14, that our oxen may be strong to labour, that there be no breaking in nor going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. That's what the psalmist writes. This is great. In the very next verse he says, Happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. You want to be happy? Yeah. Don't complain. Right. Don't murmur. Don't grumble. Look for the good yeah. rather than looking for the bad. You know, it says, in, it says in Jude, Jude chapter 1, only one chapter, verse number 16, it says, look, and this is talking about these really bad, evil, wicked, reprobate people in the book of Jude. It says these are murmurers, complainers, Walking after their own lusts. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And obviously these are particularly wicked people, but look, when you're murmuring, complaining, yep. what are you behaving like? Yep. You know, children of the devil that the book of Jude talks about. Yep. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Mm. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So notice, what was it? The people are lusting after evil things. Well notice, isn't that what it said about these wicked people in Jude? Walking after their own lusts. And they were murmuring and they were complaining. He says, look, neither be idolaters with some of them. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted with destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Learn from the example. These people, they complain, and what happened? You know, God doesn't like complaining. Your life is not going to be filled with joy if you're complaining. And moaning and whinging. Tonight's sermon is about having joy in your life. Having joy in your life. God wants our lives to be full of joy. But whether we're joyful or not, well, it's up to you. I mean, it's up to us how much we sin. You know, it's how, how, much, how much sin we choose to, pay, to partake in. You know, obviously, obviously, we're never going to be sinless and perfect. But that shouldn't stop us from making the effort to clean up our lives. You know, 
mean, it's just like a room. I mean, picture a room that's just a real mess, you know? Maybe that's, maybe that's what life is like. This room that's just a complete mess. You might say, look, oh, it's impossible to clean this room. But look, could you find something that isn't where it belongs and take that one thing and put it where it belongs? Could you find some piece of rubbish and take that and put it in the bin? Could you do that? I guess what? One, just do one thing. Find one thing to do. Do the next thing. Do the next thing. You know, and it's never ending because you know, mess just seems to, seems to happen. That's just, that's just life. Okay? But just do what you can. And you don't, don't think God's going to be pleased with that? When God sees you making the effort, you know, the Bible says he giveth more grace. If you want to have a life full of joy, then you need to cut the sin out of your life. Increase your righteousness and you will increase your joy. Our obedience and disobedience to God is going to have a massive impact on our joy. And a major part of that is how thankful we are or how, or how unthankful. It's impossibly, joy, impossibly joyful at the same time to be unthankful or ungrateful. When someone is joyful, they, they express it. They make a joyful noise. They praise. They thank. They sing. God commands us to do those things. I mean, the most frequent command in the Bible is praise the Lord. That's the most frequent command. Praise the Lord. When someone is unthankful and ungrateful, what sort of noise do they make? They moan. They whinge. They grumble. They complain. Remember that verse? Numbers 11.1. 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. <coughs> turn if you're to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. This is probably about the last place we'll turn. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. <coughs> We're talking about having joy in your lives. You see, God's given you the capacity to have joy. God desires you to have joy. But at the end of the day, it's still your choice. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 16. It says, rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you find yourself murmuring, complaining, realize it doesn't make God happy. It doesn't make the people around you happy either. The opposite of complaining is giving thanks. Look for things that you can be thankful for. You know? I mean, even think about, think about losing a child. Would that make you joyful or would that make you a bit sad? It's not a joyful thing, is it? But maybe you've got some other children. Yeah. Will that be something, something to be thankful for? I mean, most people who lose a child have got... Other children. Now, that's not always the case. I mean, remember, remember Job. What happened to Job? He lost all his children. He lost all his children. But do you think Job could find things to be thankful for? I think he could, because he was the most righteous man on the face of the earth. I mean, he actually said in Job 121, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was still thankful. I mean, I think he was thankful for the time he had with his children. And you know what? God actually restored and gave him a whole pile more children as well. And it wasn't that they were the replacement because I mean, he would have seen those other ones in heaven. He doubled his children. If you find yourself lacking joy in your life, then rather than searching for happiness, ask yourself, How, how's my obedience to God? If you want to have more joy, then try to get more righteousness in your life. And understand, you know, we know it's not our own righteousness in order to be saved. You know, we know that. Philippians 3 9. Paul says, Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We understand that. But make no mistake, God wants us to do what is right. He wants us to do what is right. Look at Matthew chapter number 6. This is the last place we can because we'll finish off by singing this. Matthew chapter number 6, <coughs> in verse number 31. Matthew chapter number 6. In verse number 31, <coughs> it says, Therefore take no thought. What's he saying? Don't worry. He says, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth ye have need of all these things. God knows what we need. He says, Look, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Rather than seeking after food and drink and clothing, seek the Lord and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad. 
Later on it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence of, is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Having joy in life. It's something that God wants us to. He wants us to have joy. As a believer, we should be filled with joy. You know? We should, Jesus said, in fact, in John 16, he said, you know, in the world you still have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Yeah. What's he saying? Rejoice. Be glad. Be happy. Be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. I pray you'd help each one of us to have joy. But help us not to be seekers of joy. Help us not to be seekers of pleasure. Because down that path is the way that leads to sin. Looking for the short term. What's the quickest way I can find joy or pleasure or, or short term happiness? Which leads to long term sadness. But instead, help us to seek righteousness. Help us to walk in a way that pleases you. Help us to be obedient. Knowing that that's what brings long term joy. Fullness of joy. Pleasures forevermore. We thank you and praise you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.